the first thing we'll do is we'll drop the study in general. I posted in study archives, but we'll put it in general, both the PDF and we'll put the, uh, I'll post the links here. We'll put the relevant graph in general chat. Here are the links to the study. This is the accepted manuscript. Don't don't ping me for random things. Like I'm I'm here to talk about this data. Don't like ping me for like oh someone wants to debate you blah blah blah. Okay. It's accept it's accepted. It's going to be published. The manuscript is accepted. It's just open access, so they allow you to see it before it it like gets published. But it this is this will be published. All right, so let's go through what's going to drop. It already it already technically has dropped the, the accepted manuscripts. So it dropped, I think, what was it, January 22nd or something, 2020? Okay. So, quick question. When I did all my inferences, what did I predict the ratio of manure usage or animal product usage to be? Anyone anyone know the figure? The ratio of conventional to organic? So I, the ratio I mentioned I think was either one to four or one to five, somewhere around there. So we'll I will we'll calculate it up and we'll see if the data that they got was anything close to what I got. Let me know if let me know if uh, my audio is okay or if I'm roboting at any point in time because and I'll just switch to my phone. Okay, cool. So what was this data? So this data is not just in the US. This was data that was taken. We'll actually just go through the study. The study was originally published to look at nitrogen footprints. On the, Organic and conventional. They found similar results for plants on nitrogen footprints. Nitrogen footprints is just the loss of nitrogen. The recycled nitrogen come from various different sources. So what they did, I'm scrolling down to the graph. They looked at, this was some, a meta-analysis that essentially looked at various different publications for organic and conventional nitrogen inputs. And what's great about this study is they actually stratified they stratified it by uh, source of nitrogen, and they looked also at nitrogen fixation. So they looked at nitrogen inputs for organic and conventional food production for recycled uh, sources. So they looked at synthetic fertilizer. They looked at nitrogen fixation by leguminous crops, biological nitrogen fixation by leguminous crop cover or green manure immediately before the crop, recycled nitrogen inputs, nitrogen from biological nitrogen fixation from another leguminous crop in the rotation. So, for example, if you're doing a legume uh, corn rotation, for example, that would be uh, another category. They looked at manure, they looked at crop residue, they looked at non-legume cover crop or green manure, they looked at compost, they looked at animal byproducts like blood meal, and the ground-up chicks, let's not forget those male chicks. Uh, organic crop data was based on 115 observations from 31 studies. Conventional crop data was based on 59 observations from 33 studies. Both organic and conventional data are scaled by livestock diet of crop inputs. And what they found was this graph, which I'll post again in general. So, is the quality of this graph clear? I can actually take another screenshot if it's not. If anyone can tell me if they're, um, it's good on their, on their eyes. 
Okay, good. So, what I love about this, I, I love about this study is that it breaks down the different sources of nitrogen, and it breaks down the different it just really has a lot of granulation. The only thing it's really missing, which the only thing this thing falls short of is fruit. Like it doesn't include fruit in it. I looked at that. Like, oh, the organic harness. This, they're just, they're going to have the whoa, but you didn't mention fruits. Like blah, blah, blah. That's the one thing. They'll, like, they'll go, oh, but fruit though. We still don't know. It's still uncertainty. Okay. But everything else. Okay, so organic grains, vegetables, starchy roots, legumes, it compares it just side by side, conventional and organic, for each different one. So, and also what it does is it looks at the different types of nitrogen inputs for these various different crops for organic and conventional. And so what you find is in this dark blue color, These, that's the new nitrogen from synthetic fertilizer. And it's not a surprise that you don't see this anywhere in organic, because organic doesn't allow you to use synthetic And you do see, you see a, an enormous reliance of it in conventional. And I think Instup is being facetious, Bryn. He knows. He knows there's no fruit stuff there. I'm saying what the organic harness are going to say. They're going to say, "Oh, they didn't compare fruit, though." All right. So the uh, the lighter shade of blue here is you see the there's new nitrogen from biological nitrogen fixation. And you and this also makes sense because look where you see that you see that in legumes in conventional legumes and organic legumes now that makes sense because legumes are good at fixating nitrogen from the atmosphere and so you don't need as much nitrogen both for synthetic fertilizer or for manure for legumes. However, it should be noted that what we know about legumes and nitrogen fixation is that legumes are different from their ability to fixate nitrogen is different depending on if they're grain legumes or if they're forage legumes. So forage legumes that are going to be fed to cattle anyway, they can fixate a lot more nitrogen than grain legumes like soy can. In fact, from everything I've read, it's up to about 50% of the nitrogen requirement can be fixated, but not more than that, compared to forage legumes, which can fixate a lot more. So that makes sense with this as well. You don't see it going over 50%. What's amazing about this, though, you should know, is that from all of these observations and all these studies on uh, conventional and organic legumes, you would, think, you would think that maybe organic would beat out on legumes of anything because they don't need as much manure. Well, neither... Neither does conventional. Conventional doesn't need as much manure for legumes either. And, and turns out, they don't. They haven't actually used that. If you look at the, if you look at this graph, none, nothing here in this legume. They actually haven't used any manure for these legumes for conventional legumes. But they used, but they did use um, manure. For legumes in conventional, I mean, sorry, in organic, which, which is amazing. You, you actually have something that's that doesn't have any animal inputs in the conventional category. Now, I don't know if that's going to pan out everywhere. I don't know if that's the case for all conventional farms, but this was a pretty comprehensive data set, and it looks like the. Don't even see the need of putting animal byproducts or manure on their legumes, whereas conventional farmers do. Starchy roots are the starchy roots like potatoes. Those are those are probably. Oh yeah, now yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna address that. Like, yeah, I I know this is coming. I know what's coming is that, oh, well, according to this argument, we should only eat legumes. 
Because they're, yeah, we should just avoid, uh, yeah, okay, we'll get there. God. The way that, the way they do this, yeah. All right. So, but let's continue with the study. So starchy, veg, starchy roots. So that's the area where they're probably the most similar. And even then, there's at least a twofold difference in the amount of manure used. And don't forget, you have to also add that little, you see that little light bar at the top? That's the animal byproducts. Also. That's the chickens, that's the blood meal, bone broth, etc. So, <clears throat> we have we have to add that in, and you do get over a twofold difference. Even in the area, even in the category where they're most similar, you still have a go over a twofold difference in manure usage from organic and conventional. And then if you do conventional vegetables, if you look at conventional vegetables, you see, I would say, I'm just eyeballing this. We could, like, the t supplementary table isn't out yet because it's pre-published. It will be published, but... Just eyeballing it, you can do a pixel calculation, whatever. It looks at least fourfold difference in um, manure usage, and then you also have to add that top that top uh, bar, which is the animal byproducts that organic is using that conventional is not. And then conventional grains, forget about it. You have this tiny little sliver, this tiny little sliver that's manure, and yeah, that's going to be at least fourfold. And then you also have yeah, that'll just be at least fourfold. So what I did is I just, I eyeballed it. Now we can get more refined. We can pixel calculate it. And what I looked at is the, I wanted to calculate up the total animal product used to, from organic to conventional. I'm just taking average. I'm not even, it's crude because I'm not doing a weighted average, which I should because different people are going to consume different things at different rates. But just some back of the envelope calculations if you look at the percentages so let's just assume uh things are just on a scale of zero to a hundred they're not i know they're not i i know this is a percentage scale not a zero to a hundred scale but bear with me if we were to do this um what you get is the ballpark i got for organic when they add them up all together and by animal i just mean when you add up the what I specifically mean is when you add up the manure and the other animal byproduct. Uh, for these areas, uh, I got 60 plus 30 plus 70 plus 20. So when we look at the data over here. So for the... Yeah, 60 would probably be the... Or Organic grains. Uh, 30 would be the organic vegetables. That's with manure plus the animal byproducts. Uh, 70, that's approximately the organic starchy roots manure usage. And you probably could put that up to 75 because if you add on the animal byproducts uh, with the organic legumes. And then you compare that to conventional. And conventional, I got about 37. So how did I get 37? Yeah, it looks like you got about, you get down to 70, so that's about 30. Uh, conventional first starchy roots for conventional vegetables, you get to around maybe five, and then you add like one or two more. So 37. So when you do the ratio out, when you look calculate the ratio, it's about 1 to 4.8. And what was the ratio I was using with my inferences, with my with my data from the FAO? Yeah, about one to five. Sometimes, or sometimes I mentioned one to four. So I think I was pretty fucking spot on. And all you people who were saying I was not, eat a dick. I'm just kidding. But seriously. <laughs> Here's the data. Now, now you can all suck on that and suck it and put that in your pipe and smoke it. Okay. Anyway, so let's talk. Let's talk about. I know the sophistry pathway is coming, so let's just talk about. Well, why don't we 
eat 100% legumes. No. <laughs> we're not going to eat 100%. Okay, so the reason we're not going to eat 100% conventional legumes is because if we set that standard for all vegans, we're going to put them all in the hospital. Okay? We're not going to, and if we do that, we're not going to save any animals doing that. All right? We're going to eat a healthy diet. Okay? And the challenge, well, I'll make sure, it, yep. Challenge is give me a biologically possible, reasonably healthy diet that will that is organic that will cause less economic demand for animal agriculture than a biologically possible reasonably healthy conventional diet i'd like to see it i've it's been out and it hasn't been met and yeah so Yeah. All right. Any does anyone have any questions about this new data? Does anyone have any questions? Um, no, you don't, you can't. You not. I would not recommend just eating a hundred percent legumes and taking a multivitamin. That sounds that that's that is not something any doctor would recommend. That sounds like a horrible idea. Oh yeah. Wait, wait, hold on. I just want to answer um, answer why though. You're losing out a lot of on a lot of things. You're losing out. I mean, just think when you eliminate everything but legumes, you're lo and and you just take a multivitamin. You're losing out on things like polyphenols. You're losing out on things like. First of all, you're also gonna look. I I'm not a I'm not a one to go about phytonutrients. I I mean, sorry on uh, anti nutrients, but all you're eating is legumes. You you might actually at that point you might actually run into some deficiencies even if you are taking a multivitamin because you're like you're actually getting 100% of your diet from that. Like low doses of certain um and this is yes this is there's no data there's no outcome based data on this because no one's dumb enough to eat 100% legumes. But we have very low tier evidence. We have low tier we have we have mechanistic speculations and reasons to say suggest okay well if you were to do this it probably is not a good idea um, and there's a reason there are reasons we don't see people doing this because it's really stupid and if they if they do it they're not going to last um, anyway so should we at least maximize okay so that's that is a good question okay so should we shift should we shift things over more to the legume intake okay so we sh we might th consider doing that i mean that's something we, we might sh look a high legume intake is a healthy diet you can have, i do think you can have a healthy diet with legumes i think people should incorporate high high amounts of legumes if they can anyway um i don't think the, but the importantly to know is that is that it's not going to be an argument. Here's the here's the real kicker. It's not going to be an argument a fortiori. It's not going to be a case where if this is carnist, therefore that is carnist. Because the difference, the discrepancy between a diet of things that are not just convention, conventional legumes and conventional legumes is not a greater difference than things that are not that then the counterparts for organic for example and that's especially true if you're talking about conventional vegetables and conventional grains i mean if you just for conventional starchy roots which are the which to be fair which are consumed but they're not anywhere close to being consumed as much as conventional grains and conventional vegetables are um in terms of just how many different categories of things you have like what do you have for starchy roots you have I mean, you have potatoes. You have, I'm sure there are other categories, but if you just compare that to conventional vegetables, like, look at the amount of manure you Remember all the people going celery and lettuce, though? Celery and lettuce, though, for to defend organic sophistry. Look at the amount used. It's minuscule. The amount of manure used 
for conventional vegetables is tiny. And conventional grains, it's just a slip. And so the amount that you're actually going to be contributing for those things is, and is minuscule. And the other point is, if the data set was larger, which it already is really large, you probably would see slivers pop into the conventional legumes at all. It may not be 100%. I'm sure there's going to be that organic farmers are going to start calling up farms or whatever. They're going to do something. We're going to come out like, oh, no, no, this conventional farm put some manure on legumes. That's the real reason. The real, that's the other reason. The other reason is, well, no, probably not that way in reality. It's probably just a function of this study's data set, which is not a limited data set. It's pretty large. It wasn't just in the U.S. The da- even though it says U.S., the, they actually mentioned that the data came from other places other than the U.S. So, in short, we don't really have that good reasons to, we don't have good reasons to only eat, we definitely don't have good reasons to only eat legumes. And I do think it wouldn't be a bad idea to shift their diet in the legume direction because they are, they are healthy food and they probably would minimize um, con- contribution. But considering all the things I just mentioned, it's not the strongest case. And it's definitely not as strong of a case for it. Can you explain now, something? What was your question? Uh, I, I just want to answer Isaac's question because he asked it before. What was your question? He might Your not. Your sound quality is a little AIDS, dude. Um, yeah, I was just asking, what was I can switch over. Hold on, I can switch. Okay. Hold on. All right. Where's my... Well, I actually don't know if I can switch right... Oh, wait, I can. Hold on. While we wait for him to switch, can anybody explain uh, why we can't offset the use of manure to other sources? Because there's other things on there like compost and recycled cover crops that are used. So why don't we just shift? guys hear me now yeah yeah Um, all right okay so my question was what was the um specific piece of sophistry that vegan foot soldier came up with that um led to you looking into this i don't remember the origins of um whatever well i i i'll 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 be honest i i kind of um i kind of sort of uh keep a little bit of a tab on this type of issue. So I wasn't actually even thinking about the sophistry directly when I was looking into this, but the sophistry, the the weasel pathway was that um, if you can make the case that organic, so here's the thing. So the original inference, which turned out to be correct, was based on data from the FAO looking at the total nitrogen inputs from manure versus synthetic fertilizer um and then just saying okay well since organic gets rid of all the synthetic fertilizer and they're a fringe they're like this tiny little percentage what you can do is you can just approximate them to zero and just say that well the manure will be the a constant for them and uh the synthetic fertilizer will just be zero for them for for organic and for conventional they'll just They'll just match the, the rates for the current synthetic fertilizer usage and the manure usage will just. And what is reported by the FAO. So, and th- when you do that, you get a ratio of about one to four to one to five. And that was my inference for the organic as a general heuristic is not vegan. Now what a weasel pathway, the weasel pathway on the table was that, well, what about crop rotation though? So the issue of the thing with crop rotation is that you can have leguminous crops 
that can fixate nitrogen. So they can actually get nitrogen from the atmosphere and they don't actually need to get it from manure. So if that's the case, and, it, and if it ha just so happens to be that organic is just doing all of these crop rotations that conventional isn't, and organic is somehow using all these legumes that are fixating nitrogen and giving the nitrogen to the other plants from the atmosphere, then in theory, it is possible for, for organic to actually be better than conventional. In theory, it's possible for organic to their nitrogen reliance, at least, to, to be from just the atmosphere, recycled from the atmosphere and not from manure. Now you can say, well, what about potassium and what about phosphorus? Because there are three main macronutrients that you need. Potassium, you need potassium, phosphorus, and nitrogen for plant growth. But you could, but uh, most of the, at least by kilogram, I believe, most of the kilogram from fertilizer comes from nitrogen. And I think most of the, I think most of the value, most of the profit comes from nitrogen fertilizers. Although that's a claim vegan foot soldier made that I, that, that might be true. I haven't looked into it yet. I really have to look into every single claim he makes because he literally just makes things up on the spot. Um, so if that is, if all those things pan out, then the, the whole organic as a general heuristic as carnist would actually fall apart. It actually is relevant because yeah, I mean, if there if there's some other fertilizer that they're using that's not an animal product that organic is just using that conventional isn't, and it's they're doing it to such a degree that offsets all of this, then, well, my inferences would be wrong. So this data was actually huge because it shows that even when you account for all of that, it's not that case at all. And yeah, the ratio is somewhere between one to four and one to five. So does that, does that answer your question? Am I making sense? And I'll, I'll just go over why. Um... Yeah, I think I'm following you. Sorry, I was making cookies. It sounds like you're saying that the sophistry pathway was, even though you researched this without the sophistry pathway directly like in mind or whatever, the sophistry pathway was like, look, like your calculation relies a lot on nitrogen and yeah, I'm just going to say like maybe these specific plants are actually like generating, what the fuck was that? Generating nitrogen for themselves and so they're not eating up this nitrogen and maybe there's a sufficiently large percentage of organic agriculture that it actually, it comes out as like a wash or even in favor of organic. So it's like, so it's like yeah. you don't need the input as much, and therefore maybe it causes less suffering. That's the idea, right? Right. Yeah, yeah that's the general idea. And and, and he actually had a paper for he had a paper to like kind of give support for it. So I saw this paper before. It's the paper. This is the paper conscientious omnivore cited. It's the paper I saw long before that. Um, but it looks at um, nitrogen inputs from sixty like sixty something um, organic farms in France. And I think like around 60% of their nitrogen input was in atmospheric nitrogen fixation. Now, when you actually look at that data, their, their estimation, the way they estimated that was pre-harvest, not, uh, sorry, it was, yeah, it was pre-harvest nitrogen fixation, not post-harvest. And the reason that's important is you have the, so we break down different types of legumes. So legumes can be forage legumes and legumes can be grain legumes. Grain legumes, so things like soy that the humans would eat. Grain legumes can only fixate about 50% of their nitrogen requirement. Forage legumes that would be fed to animals can fixate a lot more than that. And if you look at the fixation rates, the amount that they can fixate for forage legumes, they're far, more, far greater than grain legumes. So the grain the for so the forage legumes. What's happening in the organic farms? And you can even see this um, on the graph. I'll just post this graph again. The nitrogen fixation from the forage legumes. What's happening is they're just they're just going. Most of it is just going to make organic animal products. 
So if you look at the new biological nitrogen fixation, so in, these are the blue, the blue, um, the different shades of blue here. So you have, if you look at the organic tab, you see new nitrogen bi biological nitrogen fixation and new nitrogen biological nitrogen fixation from a cover crop. And you see most of it is actually, if you tally it all up, most of it's all go, they're going to different sources of animal products that are, that they label as organic animal products, organic milk, organic beef, organic pig meat, or organic poultry. And then the rest, you have a good chunk of it in organic legumes. That makes sense because there's the one synthesizing it. But compared to where it's all going, yeah, I mean, and then also you have this little, uh, this little dark green sliver. That's the recycled biological nitrogen fixation by another crop in rotation. That's also those that nitrogen is also going to these animal crops, and I guess it, and it, it makes sense because a lot of these legumes are really just forage legumes, and the, and the, those are the really nitrogen fixating powerhouses, and they're just the nitrogen there is not going to go to the plants that we eat. It's going to go to the it's going to go to the animal products. It's going to go to make an animal. So that whole defense falls apart. And it, it's confirmed by the data when you actually look at it and it breaks it down where the nitrogen goes and where it comes from. Um, even when you account for nitrogen fixation, even when you account for cro cover crops, even when you account for crop rotation, data just doesn't pan out. It, doesn't, it turns out that can, organic uses far more manure and animal byproducts. No, it doesn't. Look at the different shades of your, okay, so Belkin, look at, you're looking at two different shades of green. That darker shade, the, the intermediary dark shade of green, that's the manure. That is, doesn't even exist on legumes. What, what is there in, the, um, in that shade of green is that is the, which one is that? That's the... That's the recycled nitrogen crop residue. That's not recycled nitrogen from manure. Do you see the difference? Look at the look at the legend, Falcon. So, can I ask my question now? Yeah, yeah, sure. What's the question? So you guys covered some of it already, which is the idea that the legume production, which fixates nitrogen could be combined in rotation with other vegan crops such that, you know, there's no need for fertilizer. It's 100% coming or from or, or primarily coming from the nitrogen fixation crop that gets it out of the atmosphere. Is that what veganic farming is already doing? Veganic vegan farming vegan. is not only using that. They're also, they're using things like green manure. They're using things. It's, it's, it, it's, and yes, they are using nitrogen fixation as well. Um, it's it's i think it's fringe and if you can buy it go for it i just i also haven't i hope it is scalable i hope it really is but based on the data i'm seeing here i'm just really not convinced because even if you look at even in the organic inputs if you look at the bnf by another cover crop so the rotation you you see slivers you see slivers of nitrogen that goes into all these different products um even in legumes uh in organic vegetables organic grains uh, I, I, the question I have is if that is driven by market, right? So we okay, know that it, it, could, it could be that's true, but it's not not just driven by market because when I looked at other data, when it when they after the post harvest, after they after harvesting legumes, um, when you look at the post harvest numbers, the amount of nitrogen that's left over wasn't that impressive. So I'm not sure that it's very scalable, and it could just be that the organic farmers are just taking greens from other areas and just using the not the non-animal sources and it just may not be sustainable i don't know the answer to that i have to look into that more based on everything i've seen i haven't seen a clear case that it's scalable but i could be wrong okay because it seems like manure is basically something which is a, a, a byproduct so manure is just being created and it's making money as a byproduct at any, at any price it would make the people who are getting rid of it um i don't know about any I'm not sure about any price. Um, it could, it could be that. Well, if by any we include negative numbers. If we include any, if we include incurred costs, then definitely not. But 
um, yeah, it is a byproduct, and the byproduct can incur a cost. The byproduct can incur a profit. Um, it's just hard to compete. Yeah, if it's if it's making enough money, it could just be that it's hard to compete with the with the crop rotations. But the um, conventional fertilizers are so effective that they do beat even a free product like manure. Or oh, I, I potentially, free product. potentially, yeah, sure. And and not they're so effective, and they're they're more expensive per pound. It's just that they're not more expensive per nitrogen. Uh, they, they're sorry, they're more expensive per pound. It's just they're not more expensive per amount of nitrogen because they're just pure nitrogen. It's not a bunch of carbon in there or anything. So yeah, I mean, the apparent that that could be very well be the case. Um, what we should be, what I would like to do is I would like to make it. I mean, I would like to make this all known. I would like to make it known that. We want to do this not just because it's cheap and effective. We want to do it because because of the ethical concern. And if you want to go to instead of the synthetic fertilizer, you want to go to green manure or something. If that's really scale scalable, you can you can do that. I don't have a problem with it. I just have a problem with using the blood of. I have a pro, look. I have a problem with using the blood of slaughtered animals to grow crops. I have a problem with using ground up chicks to use macerated chicks their their bodies for crops. I have a problem with using the, yes, the problem of using manure for crops. That's the that goal. Kind of... Like if the goal is to, uh, is to draw down and eventually end the animal uh, livestock production as a whole, then the replacement has to be uh, evident and the scale that that replacement can reach has to be able to fulfill the need. So what you're saying yeah. is right now conventional fertilizer could do it. But it's worth investigating if we, for climate reasons, need to slow down on the conventional fertilizer use, then there, or environmental damage reasons, then we have. Oh, to we reason. would. We we absolutely would if we if we decrease. Look, most of this fertilizer for all these things are going for animal feed anyway. Um, if we if we ended animal agriculture, if we the amounts of fertilizer we would need across the board would go would, would go down drastically. Yeah, yeah. Most most of the food we're feeding is to cows. I mean, cattle. Yeah, of course. We, our 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 need for synthetic fertilizer. If we ended animal ag, our need for synthetic fertilizer would plummet. But so would our supply of manure. So we would have to be. It would far far. I mean, look. Yeah, that's true. But far, I think it would be far more. Uh, and we can go through those numbers too. We would also be able to use human manure too. You, there's nothing. We also use some amount of human manure. And I think that can be upscaled. Yeah, my understanding is you have it in a cycle that's like one or two steps removed from the actual food consumption, right? You like feed it to a crop and then you use that crop as a as a fertilizer. It's used in permaculture stuff, right? You know, I understand. I, I understand. Um, just the thing, the, the thing is that I don't think it's it's a real concern. If like we were to end animal agriculture, what would we do? Like, I, I really don't think that's a, that's a big concern. If we were to end animal agriculture we would have far, we would be downscaling, even without the manure, we would be downscaling our synthetic fertilizer usage. We wouldn't be upscaling it. When they use the when term in this report, footprint, footprint. They, they talk uh, about foot, footprint. Yeah, yeah, they talk about nitrogen footprint. So how much nitrogen is being leaked out, basically? How much nitrogen is going, is, uh, is going to waste? That, that's why they did the study in the first place. They didn't actually do the study to look at inputs, but they needed to look at inputs in order to, for the sake of the study, which I'm happy. Um, and they found for footprints that the nitrogen footprints were, were fairly equal. Um, organic beef had a higher nitrogen footprint than the conventional beef, but in other categories, they were virtually identical. Uh, of course, uh, can organic used uh, recycled more nitrogen than conventional, which, which makes sense because conventional is using a whole bunch of new nitrogen in synthetic fertilizer. So the point here is that um, <laughs> the evidence is here, the breakdown is here, the numbers are what they are. They're from numerous different observations from numerous different studies, and not all the studies are limited to the U.S. And yeah, guess what? That ratio thing of one to four, one to five, that people are saying, oh, it's just weak and I don't have any, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know where he's getting his data. Yeah, that all turned out to be right. So suck it. Anyway. Um, Isaac, is what I'm saying, did, were you following what I was saying before? I'm sorry, I didn't get to answer, 
to ask you if like I want to make sure um because if Isaac general rule of thumb here is that if Isaac's not following then no one is following so what would I well, answer cookies. oh okay so Okay, cool. No, I mean just your question that I was asking that that you asked me before about the the, the sophistry pathway. Oh, about, uh, yeah. I mean, it just oh. it just sounds like you tried to say maybe there's so much, you know, nitrogen generating plants being far like legumes or whatever being farmed in organic that it actually offsets the damage done in terms of Holocaust support such that organic isn't bad. Which it sounds it sounds like he didn't give any evidence or he gave very weak evidence for that. Um, you know, it's, it's just what VF does. He throws bullshit at the wall and hopes something sticks. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, the point that he couldn't establish, uh, in the first place turned out actually to be false, which is, you know, not yep. surprising. Yeah. And I still have to go through that five hour debate and all the other claims he made. Like, this is just one, I mean, it's, to me, that was the most important claim he made because that this is my whole reason, um, for avoiding organic because this on a threshold deontology so for me this is all i need um to like conclusively say that just he was full of shit and he's he's wrong um but i'm ha at some point i'm gonna have to go through all the other claims he made because he just throws he just makes things up mid, he makes things up in the debate yeah well <laughs> yeah you have to actually experience it to realize just how bad faith he is like I mean, the, the thing you have to understand about VF is he just doesn't have a sense of shame or dignity, right? Like, he'll just make shit up. Like, he'll, he'll literally just completely bullshit you to your face, just making up random shit as he goes, right? Anything to avoid conceding a point, anything to avoid admitting he was wrong about something, right? You know, you force him to concede something, oh, name the trait sound. Oh, well, name the trait doesn't represent name the trait. <laughs> or, um... You know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's had a million. I'll times. give you an example. Yeah, I mean, the example I had was when he, he talks about, um, <laughs> was when he talked about bird deaths. And then I asked him, like, okay, well, what's the differential? And he said, well, it, he said, at first he said, well, he actually said infinity at one point. Um, <laughs> but then when I, when I explained to him how it, um, subtraction worked, and let me, that the differential doesn't mean di division, <laughs> um, he said, oh, well, the number is zero for organic. I'm like, really? It's zero for organic? And I'm like, did you just make it up? And he said, based on my research. And he typed into Google for a couple of seconds. And I'm like, and by based on your research, do you mean that five-second Google search you just did? He's like, yes. Oh, yeah. No, oh, yeah. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's a complete piece of shit. He's human garbage. I mean, he'll, uh, he is just a pathological liar. He's a motivated reasoner. All he'll do is sit there, you know, come just generating random bullshit hoping something sticks if there's any point that you can't respond to even if he can't establish the thing he'll try to like milk that for all that it's worth um and i'm glad that you now understand from dealing with him in that interaction that the only way to appropriately deal with vf is to either give a syllogism and force him to attack the premises or to ask him for a syllogism and then make fun of him for not being able to, or if he gives one to show what, you know, make fun of him for not being able to justify the premises. That's the only way to spend time with someone like that. Um, the other thing is, you you have to understand, like, he'll spend forever trying to characterize, like, how the debate happened and trying to say all these things, you're wrong about this, you're wrong about that, this is what actually happened. Like, just trying to manipulate history, right? He has an absurd amount of energy that he'll put into... Uh, reconstructing past events to sh try to shape public perception in his favor. It's actually insane as far as, <laughs> you know, as, far as I'm concerned. But um, yeah, the important thing to realize is like, that's just an effort game. Like how much you want to sit there, you know, trying to bullshit people into believing your like account of events. And the better thing to do is, because I've tried both, instead of trying to battle it with VF on like, this is how things went. Here are your messages. Here are your screenshots. Because we know from the AI thing, if you do that, he'll just come up with some demented hermeneutics for everything he says, even if it twists his messages to the point that they don't even make sense anymore, right? It's like, he'll reinvent the entire situation. He'll bring up, you know, five new, like, false contextual factors that you have to, like, debunk every time you show something doesn't make sense. Like, it's just insane, right? So the best thing to do is just to say, you know what? 
VF can try to characterize things however the fuck he wants. Does he have an argument that shows I'm wrong about X? And that's all that there is to say about it. Yep. Does anyone have any uh, other questions about the uh, the new organic data that just dropped and if any uh, any ethical implications, if any, or any questions about organic in general? All right. Well, if there are no other questions, then that's it. That's what I wanted to talk to you guys for today. Thank you all for your time.